Good morning, good evening, and good night to everyone across the globe. Uh, my name is Michael Connes. I'm the Senior Technology and Workflow Consultant here at Keycode Media. And today we're going to bring you a webinar regarding Keycode Media and Ion Software, more specifically the Fusion uh, portion of the Ion Software suite. Uh, our focus today is going to be pretty cut and dry. Um, we're going to be focusing on what the Ion Software package can do uh, with with you uh, within Avid Media Composer, specifically on the PC uh, platform. Our agenda today is pretty simple. First off, we're going to talk a little bit about Key Code Media. Then we're going to the fine folks at Ion Software will actually be demoing Fusion before your very eyes. Then we'll be answering questions. Then we'll be taking questions uh, to both Ion Software as well as Key Code Media. And then finally, we'll talk about what we here at Key Code Media are doing to keep you ahead of technology uh, with the Ion Software suite. First off. Who is Keycode Media? Well, Keycode Media enables digital media communication. I know that's a little bit of a, a nebulous term, but essentially it means everything from acquisition to distribution, uh, Keycode Media is your best technology resource, period. Uh, whether it's pre-sales consulting, whether it's designing a solution specifically for your workflow, whether it's engineering a complete knock or post facility, uh, whether it's sales or even financing of that gear, uh, all the way through integration and of course service post-sale. Uh, we handle all of this through broadcast, everything from internet broadcasting to terrestrial and satellite broadcasting, everything from one or two man bands all the way up to, uh, at least out here in California, W and K stations. Uh, when we're talking entertainment, everything from reality television to feature films to independent pieces, uh, corporate in terms of corporate communications, internal or external, or even getting your message out to things like digital signage and mobile devices. Uh, government, uh, secure communications between different agencies, uh, foreign and domestic, and of course education, everything from getting your students up to speed on what's current, what's new, what's hip, what's going to carry them in the future, as well as your infrastructure uh, moving forward. So why is Keycode Media chose, uh, chosen Ion uh, Fusion? Well, for a couple different reasons. First off, there are of course glaring gaps in editorial applications out there. One of them most notably is compositing. Compositing is traditionally not found in editorial applications, especially within Media Composer. It's very limited. So Fusion allows you to have this capability where it previously didn't exist. Um, it allows for resolutions above HD. While Media Composer is a fantastic editorial application, I'm sure all of you out there who are working with resolutions above HD know that it's rather difficult to deal with. 2K, 2.5K, 3K, or the inevitable 90K. Uh, quite frankly, it just isn't available um, within Media Composer now. So being able to use Fusion to get to these resolutions is just fantastic. Um, back in the day, and when I say day, I meant 10 years ago, uh, you needed to have multiple systems to do uh, your effects and your editing, and now we can put this all on one system, which of course makes your investment uh, that much uh, cheaper and gets you going and gets your money back sooner rather than later. Uh, one of the other things, and those of you who know me know I love stereoscopic stuff, and the Dimension plugin from Ion allows you to have greater stereoscopic feature sets uh, than what is currently available in Media Composer. Those of you who are using Media Composer 6 know that there's a ton of features in there for, Media Compo uh, for stereoscopic, but uh, the Dimension plugin adds that much more. Next, it obviously makes you more marketable. Uh, as you know, everyone out there thinks they're an editor. And now that, uh, and if you are one of those people, you now can do compositing as well. And that, of course, makes you more in demand and more marketable for more jobs out there in the field. Uh, that's, of course, is of utmost importance to us because we want to make sure we're, we're keeping you technology, uh, ahead of technology here at Keycode Media. And then lastly, how we're making this available to you. After the presentation, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some promotional bundles we have for you uh, to get you started down this road, as well as other things that Keycode Media can do to help you down this road of uh, working with compositing, uh, this compositing portion within Media Composer. So enough of my drivel. We're going to move over to Jeff Krebs, who's the Director of Sales at Ion Software. Uh, and so give me a second to switch over to him and we'll be right back. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm hoping everyone uh, can hear. Uh, me out there. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview, um, history of where I come from. I'm, you know, currently uh, working with Ion Software, which I am thrilled to be doing. Um, but, you know, I my, my career actually started in the mid 80s. I actually started editing in the mid 80s, you know, cutting on films and fil uh, film on Steenbecks and Moviolas, moved to Linear Suite, 
And in 1989, I had the privilege of working on an Avid One media composer, serial number 003, uh, beta 094 software, so pre-release software. And at that point, um, I had the privilege of paying $60,000 for being the first on the block. You know, I loved it so much that years late, a couple of years later, in 1992, I joined up with um, Avid Technology and started Avid uh, Technology in Canada. And I stuck around there for 19, till 1999 doing uh, pre-sales and uh, some software development as well. At that point, uh, I decided to join up with a company called Alliance Atlantis, where I was a symphony editor on numerous movies of the week and uh, TV series and what have you. Included in that roster of programs, I began with a series called Gene Roddenberry's Earth Final Conflict, which was actually one of the first uh, TV series to work in 24P or 2398 at that point. And I needed to not only do the editorial and uh, in, you know insert all the effects work, but I had to do a lot of creation of effects work. And I discovered this really cool product at a trade show called Digital Fusion. And it looked kind of cool. There was these blocks and these pipes and you join everything together. And I was told, hey, these are called nodes. And I fell in love with it instantly. Um, it was just the freedom of the layers that I was originally using and continually frustrated um, with the lack of control that I had over the visual effects environment. And I worked hand in hand with a VFX facility um, called Caliber and the post supervisor on the series found that when I was working on shots, I was able to outperform the facility in shots as well as keeping the price significantly lower. And I was able to complete many more shots in the same allotted time frame with better quality results. So I did that for two years and I kept taking on more and more and heavier, heavier shots, uh, certainly much more complex shots. And for that, I was nominated for a Gemini, which is kind of the Canadian version of an Emmy um, for VFX and as well along alongside of the uh, rest of the VFX team. So I was part of that um, uh, nomination as well. And after that, I decided to run my own HD post facility um, and I ran it with an Avid DS and absolutely required fusion and did that for about 10 years. Then as a little bit of freelance, 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 and then I joined up with Ion Software. And for me, it was a complete pleasure when you're kind of a little bit fanatical about software as I am. It was such a pleasure to join up with a company that you've been a fan of for so many years. So that's where I am today and absolutely loving it. And can, so that's where we are. Um, at that point, at this point, what I'd like to do is uh, throw it over to uh, Joanne DeCare, who is our Executive Vice President of ION Software. And she'd like to give you just a brief overview of ION Software and the pedigree in film and how we've moved towards um, the Avid market. So with that, I'd like to introduce Joanne. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Jeff. I uh, just wanted to say two words, really, because the keystone of this presentation is about to take place, and you'll see quite quickly why we believe that the AVID, um, I guess you could say, mindset really gets fusion. We made a shift last year, and that's why we hired Jeff, to go from focusing on the niche film community to opening up specifically to the AVID community because we have had hundreds and hundreds and then thousands of AVID artists over the years asking us to take their workflow just that next step adding that value that really puts them in a different bracket sets them apart from the the day-to-day -day that they're they're competing in a market now where they need to you know add value uh, in any way shape or form so 
Jeff is going to show you how our 25 years of high-end film and working with the, the Ronald, Ro Roland Emmerichs of the world, that doesn't roll off the tongue too fast, uh, can really bring our product into a scope that you will absolutely uh, appreciate and I really think you're going to want to pick his brain for the next two or three weeks because it's, it's exactly how you're going to want to work. Here you go, Jeff. Okay, to begin with, it's important to really understand the Fusion interface and all the wonderful tools that we have available. To begin with, I'm going to show you the bin system. The bin can reside locally on your computer or can be shared on a network so multiple artists and editors can access it. In this example, I have specific folders that I've pre-created in advance. I can store my favorites, my settings, and then I have access, of course, to the complete Fusion Tool Library. If I jump back to the very first folder, you'll notice I have some images here. I can either drag and drop them onto the flow or just double click on them. Here's a still image which is represented as a clip. We actually call it a loader. In this case, this loader or this clip happens to be a 4K image. I can drag from my toolbar. I'll happen to drag a background. This background happens to be 720p. It can be any resolution, of course. If I drag the output of the loaders together, we create a merge. This is the simplest composite and the basis of all compositing within Fusion. I'll drag and drop it to my viewport. And now we have a 4K image residing within a 720p background. And at this point I can interactively scale it, I can interactively rotate it. You also have your controls on the side where you can adjust the sliders, you can hit the reset button, you can composite in a variety of different methods using these apply modes. But I'm going to create a roster move. It is the simplest effect that I can create in Fusion. I'll begin by animating the size. I'll start with it zoomed in and zoom it out just like this. So if I hit the play button, here's the result. What you'll notice at the bottom of the screen is that we in fact are playing back at 2398 frames per second. And you can see there's a little stall at the beginning because that's where I happen to set the first keyframe. And we can switch interactively to a timeline view or to a spline view. If I jump to the timeline view and I want the keyframe to start earlier, I'll just drag it earlier. You'll notice that the player hasn't stopped that I was able to drag that keyframe without having to stop the player. The same goes with animation interactivity. Here's the animation represented as a spline. I'll smooth it so I ease in and ease out. I have full control over the handles without having to stop the player. It's a very fast and interactive way of creating a roster move. So now that you've seen a little bit of the Fusion interface, let's switch over to Avid and start playing with Ion Connection. By simply opening up the Effect Palette, you'll see we have an Ion category in here and the Ion Connection plugin. And I can just drag and drop it onto the timeline. We could also work with transitions and layers. In this case, it's asking how many layers we have. We only have one, so we say OK. Now I'll open up the Effect Editor. When you look at the Effect Editor, you'll see a variety of buttons export clip. I can click on that, and very quickly the clip is exported to Fusion. And I also have Edit Effect and Browse for Location. We do understand the Avid project information right down to the sequence, right down to the clip name. So in this case, I'm going to say Edit Effect. When I say Edit Effect, Fusion automatically receives the clip that is associated with the timeline. You also get a saver. This is what the link back to the timeline is going to be. So in its simplest form I will apply a color correction. Let me whack it out a little bit to an amber sunset look. If I hit the render button and jump back to Avid you will notice right away the result appears in the timeline and where it hasn't appeared it means that the image was still processing. So you can click 
on anywhere on the clip to see the result. What this also means is I can continue the editing process while an effect is still processing inside Fusion. So let's switch back to Fusion and let's have a little bit of fun. We'll add a tracker, let's say, to begin with. There's our tracker and I'm just going to connect it up to the original source. Now, I'll drag, there we go, I will drag the tracker over the light. At this point I'm at the end of my sequence but no worry, I'll just track backwards. There we go, we've tracked backwards and now we have our tracking data. We're going to want to apply some tools and uh, have a little bit of fun with this light over here. So we'll open up our little tool script and I'm going to add a hotspot. There it is. Take a look at it. I'm going to drag it over the light. And let's interactively adjust the sizing. Very fast, very interactive. And just for fun, let's add some rays of light. Type in the word rays. There, there's some rays. Again, I'll patch that into our comp. There's some rays of light. Again, interactively adjust where I want the light position. Okay, if we take a look at our hotspot and hit the play button, we have a little bit of issue. And the issue is the uh, hotspot isn't following the tracker. So I will jump to the beginning and I will click on the hotspot and tell it to connect to the tracker position. Same thing with the rays of light. I will right click on it and say connect to the tracker position. So when we take a look here we have the result where it's in fact following the light. The other issue is it's a little bit intense with this light so let me just take brightness down in the blend value. We can play with the decay and the weight of the rays and all these different sliders interactively but I'm also going to want to mask this a little bit because I don't want the rays of light affecting his face. So in this case I will apply one of our many interactive masks. We have primitive shapes, we have beast blinds and Bezier tools, everything is animatable of course and I am going to connect the center of the mask to the tracker position and if we hit the play button you can now see the result. Of course it's a little bit harsh so I'm going to want to adjust the softness on the edge. You'll notice I don't actually have to stop the player to do this. I could interactively adjust the slider while the image is playing so I get a better result because I can see how it's affected on moving pictures. So at this point there's our final uh, image and I hit the render button and again as before I'll switch back to the Avid and it's already populated the timeline and there's the final result just like that. So now that we've had a little bit of fun with Ion Connection on the Avid timeline let's switch back to Fusion and look at this very cool comp. Besides looking really great on the Fusion Flow it is in fact going to be another rostrum move but this time we're going to be dealing with a 3D rostrum move with interaxial offsets between image layers. So if you take a look we've actually done a little bit of mask work for the Beatles. We've also done some paint and some repair brush work all done in Fusion with Fusion Paint. Now, most important part about this is I have applied all of these layers to individual image planes as you can see as I drag them into the viewport. If we take a look at this merge, this merge is called a 3D merge. It allows me to see all the layers and in fact all associated cameras which I have created and I'm going to shoot this scene with. So here we have four beetles, so we have four associated cameras on the Fusion Flow. You also have four associated renderers, and these renderers are looking at the outputs of each camera. So if I hit the play button, that you can see all four cameras starting from a single position and zooming into the heads of all four of the beetles. In this view we could actually take a look at camera one, that's camera three, 
there's camera 2 and camera 4 there it is camera 4 so if you see the actual result if I play the result out through the renderer you could see how the layer offsets are playing and how the axis in the background moves slower than the axis in the foreground there's camera 1 camera 2 camera 3 and camera 4. The other thing you'll notice is that we can view the spline view and I can still make the interaction between the splines without having to stop the player. So if I look at camera 1 and then look at the spline I can make the offset and you can see I can wiggle the camera around if I wish as well. Finally you'll notice that we have four savers, camera 1, 2, 3, and 4. So you not only have multiple inputs, multiple cameras, and multiple comp outputs from one single fusion composition. So now that we've had a little bit of fun with uh, 3D roster moves, what we'll do is open up another comp, and in this comp I will show you the final result, and then we'll do a little bit of deconstruction. So here's a street scene. It's kind of exciting. We have a camera move. We have glowing windows and these rain water spouts and rain and a little bit of ground fog, as you can see here. But how did we begin with this scene? Well, in fact, we began with a still photograph, just like this. And we're going to do some very interesting treatments on it. The first thing we're going to want to do is apply a night effect. The way we did this, if we open up our little node, we combined a whole variety of color correction and polygons and some glow effects to create this night look. Now, what you'll notice is that we branch off into two different areas. We branch off into a luminance gear and we branch off into a shader. And there's a reason why we're doing this. We're going to now convert our two-dimensional image into three-dimensional space. So the luminance gear will give me a little bit of highlight. I've applied a bump map and a blend shader. In Fusion you have infinite amounts of shader control where you can apply the look that you want to geometric objects and to geometric shapes. So in this case we're going to apply it to a still image plane. Here is the original pre-look prior to applying that look and here is what it is like when we apply that scary night look to it. So you can see the light reacts very differently. Now we're going to want to create some depth. If we zoom into our nodes we have a displacement node and what this displacement node does is it lets me create real depth. How do we do that? Well, let me show you. This is our depth map. A depth map is created inside Fusion. White will represent our two screen image and black is further away and any shades of gray are what is in fact creating the depth. So that's how we created the depth. Depth map created directly inside Fusion. Now we're going to want to take a look at this scene. So if I play over here you'll notice that we have camera movement and we actually have a light traveling down the street as well. If you want to see what this looks like we can take a look at it from the camera view and you can see that we are in fact traveling into 3D space. But now what I'm going to want to do is add some environmental effects and you already saw some of the water spouts. These were created through our particle system. If I expand this a little bit you can see we have our particle system and we have the ability to affect it with directional forces and turbulences and a whole variety of other tools that we'll revisit later uh, in another comp. And as well we have 3D particles and those are viewable over here. This happens to be 3D rain, so you can see I can rotate it around any axis and see the rain from all angles. And then, of course, the ability to take this entire comp and put it all together. And as I play here, you are actually seeing it process and render in high quality mode at about two frames per second as I'm rendering it on my laptop here. So very quick, 
very interactive render, and of course a very cool comp made from a still photograph. So now that we've had a little bit of fun with the street comp, we'll switch back to Avid and do a little bit more work with the ION connection. I'm going to open up the effect palette and instead of applying the ION connection to a single clip, let's apply it to a transition point. So in this case we have a one second transition associated with it. Open the connection in the effect window. Instantly let's export the clip. This time it's going to export two clips. It's going to export the outgoing shot and the incoming shot and as before we have the ability to edit the effect, browse for the location. In this case we will hit edit effect and instantly in the fusion comp we have the outgoing shot just like this and the incoming shot there is the incoming shot and a dissolve has been applied because it applied a transition so it used a factory default of a dissolve of course this can change to anything you want we're going to do a simple transition to begin with and then I'll show you some examples of more complex transitions. So in this case, let's start with doing some color correction. I'll move the outgoing shot node over here and of course you can see in the timeline how there is a one loader for the outgoing, one loader for the incoming and the associated dissolve. In this case, let's add and apply a color correct. Like before, let's perhaps make it a little bit amber, a little bit early morning, and I'm going to now copy this color correction and I am going to paste it down, not as a direct copy, but as an instance. And the reason we're going to do this is I'm going to apply it to the incoming shot. So let's say we would like to instead of making it an amber look cool down the shot create a blue cast to it if we check the instance out of the incoming shot it also receives it and that's the technology of working with instances as opposed to just saving settings and reapplying it through the shot create the effect once and just instance it anywhere on your comp so now the dissolve takes place with the shots being very similar in color grade. The next step is to apply some effects prior to the color grade. Now, you're not limited in effects. Any effect can be applied and only touch the associated clip. This becomes more important in layers where you can apply effects to layers and not have to worry about layers below adopting that effect. Every effect is completely independent. So in this case, let's apply a blur on the outgoing shot. There's the blur. I'll blur it into the shot. So let's go to the last frame and animate it. And go to the first frame and reset it to zero. So the result looks something like this. And just for fun, let's jump to the end and blur it to a greater value. So this time, let's copy this blur and we will paste it, not as an instance, but as a direct effect to the incoming shot. At this point, I'm going to want to blur out as opposed to blurring into the shot. So a simple way of doing that is taking the associated spline and just reversing the value. So now it unblurs as opposed to blurring into the shot. If we take a look at the result, the result looks like this. My issue now is I really want to keep the outgoing shot sharp around the rowers. So I'm going to use a polygon effect mask and just draw around the rowers really quick. There's our polyline mask and there's our result, but you'll notice I need to invert that mask. So it's a simple matter of selecting the mask and clicking the invert button. The edges are a little bit harsh, so I'm going to make a little bit of softness and make that adjustment, and bias by adjusting the border width into the effect mask as opposed to away from it. 
It's important to note that the polygon masks in any masks I apply, whether it be one or a run of masks, it's actually a separate node that can be piped into any effect. So it can be originating on my blur effect, but it's a simple matter of applying it to any other effect by simply dragging it to the effect mask input. So the end result of this effect looks something like this. We have color grading used through an instance and we have a final dissolve applied. But let's say we don't want to use a dissolve if we want to use any other transitional effect in this simple example. I'll just click on the effect and in this case I'll perhaps use a Sempty wipe and the result works just as well. So I'll hit the render button and you will notice that the result is automatically updating the timeline in the Media Composer. As I mentioned earlier, I'd like to play a transition that involves fusion and ion connection. This leads us to our next section of the Fusion Particle Suite. In this example, we're going to have a little bit of fun with text and particles combined together. And we'll begin at the beginning of the comp. So let's pan on over and you'll notice that we have some text. And we have an instance of the text. And the way this works is we have actually have a mask, a rectangle mask, cutting off the top and bottom. And this is where we begin to work in parallel with the top and bottom and a lot of instancing which gives you a ton of freedom uh, meaning that you only have to animate one and the reflection is automatically created for you. So since this is combined together we begin to branch off in two different directions. One direction is going to give us our image control for the font itself. The other direction is going to give us our particle stream. The simple concept of particles as displayed by these pink nodes is that you always begin with a particle emitter and end with a particle renderer. Now particles can exist as two-dimensional or three-dimensional. Now particle tools are very deep and we only have limited time in this webinar and I will provide additional links so you can have a greater look into Fusion's particle suite. If you look at the particle emitter we begin with the ability to adjust the controls, the style, the region, and the renderer depicts whether you're going to be working in two dimensions or three dimensions, and you have image controls, translation controls, coordinate controls, and the final rendering resolution. And in between, by clicking on these icons, these are the individual controls of how the particle is being influenced. As you can see, there's numerous controls that affect particles, including the ability to feed bitmap imagery into a particle emitter. One of the interesting things here is we can begin to play the particle stream, and you are now just looking at the particle stream only, and you really do not have to stop the player, as in a lot of effects in Fusion. So in this case, for instance, if I'm taking the color from the region, which happened to be orange, I can of course change the style, and it just takes a second to recalculate it, and you have the result. So Fusion allows you to view a lot of elements in real time. For instance, if I want to adjust the number variance, meaning it's a plus or minus situation, I could simply make the expansion and adjust that. The lifespan increasing or decreasing the lifespan, you can see the result. So we combine it together, and we have a new particle look. And of course, we can jump to the beginning, and you still have the ability to change the content of the text. If I jump to the beginning and type in the word key code and hit our play button, we have now created new content for the source and the final result looks something like this. Okay, let's jump back to Avid, and now that we're in the Media Composer, we've worked with transitions, we've worked with single clip layers, but what happens if we have multiple layers? How do we deal with that? Well, here are some layers on the timeline. I happen to have four here, 
and I will again open up my ion connection and I will drag and drop to the timeline this time will say that there is four layers in our layer count and again jump to the effect mode export the clips and as always we understand the sequence information the project information and right down to the clip level information so we'll just let this export happen and we are in fact attacking the RGB files directly inside the MXF and we'll let it finish up. So, jump over to Ion Connection, say edit the effect, and what you will notice is the effect has been brought over to Fusion. At this point we have layer 1, layer 2, layer 3, and layer 4. But what has also happened is an auto connection is been created and we've always spoke about the merge being the basis of compositing and that's in fact what has happened it's put in all the merges it understands the frame count and the other thing that it does understand is the actual frame format it is associated with the Avid project so you can see it re it's represented as 1920 by 1080 at 24 frames and of course a saver is put on the output which as we mentioned earlier links directly to the Avid timeline from Fusion. So in this case something very simple let's just have a little bit of fun we'll do a little bit of screen compositing and we'll make this a soft light it's gonna get a little bit messy and we'll take a look at the final and maybe we'll just blend it down so what we've done we've just built a small composite there and again as we hit the render button and jump back into Avid, automatically you see the results populating the Avid timeline. So let's switch to something a little bit more relevant. I'm going to open up another sequence over here. We actually have the final effect already created, the composite already created, uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to revisit that composite by simply saying edit effect. I don't have to re-export the clip and the Fusion Comp is directly linked to the Avid timeline. So by saying edit effect, what happens is the comp is loaded that was associated to the timeline. So here I have the original blue screen. Of course I have the background plates up above. And we have built this sequence by a series of background plates and 3D particles. So I took the background plate and color corrected it and merged the result of the particles. So we have the snow particles on the background plate. If we take a look in the single viewport you'll notice that it is mapped into 3D space. We have the exact same background map instanced the color correction so it has the same look but we applied a polygon mask to the corner of the tree and that is our second layer and you can see how it's composited in 3D just like this. You'll also notice that there is a blue screen layer that we haven't treated yet. I'll move down to that and here's the blue screen layer. Now Fusion includes Primat 5 so to pull a blue screen key out of this I can go through the different steps, but I find it easier to use the auto compute to get the final result. Each of our viewports has an A and B input. So I can switch to the B, load the same footage, but view the alpha channel. Now I simply switch to the AB splitter, then I can view the split between the full RGB and the alpha channel. I also notice that the background has a little bit of a magenta hue as it's using a complementary color to replace the edge. So I may want to go under my replace and tell it to use a color value as opposed to a complementary color. And in this case I'll just darken this just a bit. If we take a look now, you can see how all the plates line up. We also have an associated camera shooting the entire scene. The final part of this comp is the particle system. And in this case what we've done is we've generated the snow particles in 3D space and we can view any angle we wish. If you take a look at the emitter you'll see we've used a cube 
as the emitter region and I've picked a blob as the style. So you'll notice we can still zoom in here and when we zoom in it actually does look like snow particles and I could still do things in real time like affect the size. That might be a little large so I'll undo that but the variance in size and all the turbulence and directional force controls can be accessed and manipulated in real time. So if we zoom out a little bit on our comp and let's merge it all together you can see the result with the associated camera. Now you still have the ability to add additional sources to these composition nodes including the ability to light in 3D and you can avoid specific layers if you wish. For instance I'm not lighting the blue screen layer or the background layer but in fact just lighting the particle system. And we end all 3D sequences with a renderer and this is where you get your final result. I'll add a little bit more color correction to the entire scene and here's our saver which links directly back to the Avid timeline. I've been continuously talking about the Fusion 3D space and up until now we've been mentioning the cameras but I haven't really shown you a lot of the details about the camera. The right viewport contains a renderer and the left viewport contains a merge. And what you'll notice here is that I do have camera control. If I decide I want to manipulate the camera position, you can see the result in the renderer, just like that. What's really great about the camera as well is not only that you can position in XYZ space with the ability to use a target and rotation controls, but the controls for the camera optics are also included in the camera node. So if you take a look at the renderer, you'll see I have accumulation effects enabled which gives me a real world depth of field. It also gives me the ability to adjust the plane of focus for the depth of field. So I can make an adjustment by simply manipulating the slider or typing in a depth of field amount. If you look on the left of the screen you'll see the depth of field grid as it passes over the object so you get an idea of exactly where the plane of focus happens to be. So there we have the word cameras very sharp in focus and of course I can manipulate that so the word fusion takes the main point of the focus. Fusion cameras are incredibly flexible and with real world optics they give you unlimited creative control. As mentioned earlier fusion not only supports primitive objects internally but we could also import 3D geometry from a variety of 3D animation packages. This object has been imported from Lightwave. Besides having the ability to play back the animation, as you can see here, we can rotate and look at the object from any angle as we are a true 3D compositor. The other area to note is that this is not a baked-in animation mesh. This animation contains point cache data which is essentially the storage of vertices on a frame-by-frame -frame basis. So this is not baked-in animation this is point cache data playing back the animation which would allow you to do things like this. Create a final render with motion blur and shadow casting generated inside Fusion. If the final images were just imported you wouldn't be able to receive these types of results. Let's have a little bit more fun with 3D graphics and the 3D environment in Fusion to be exact. Here you see a familiar logo with rays of light passing through the logo. Let me break this apart for you and show you how this was created. If we scroll down our comp to the beginning, we begin with a 3D text tool. This happens to be the Avid logo. It was created and the shapes assigned to keystrokes on a font. And I have amazing amounts of control in the font, including the ability to uh, adjust the extrusion depth, the bevel width, the layout, the transformations, and of course all the shading and the materials associated with the font. So next, how do we create the animation? Well, the animation is using our duplicate 3D tool. We zoom out on our viewport here and look at the duplicate tool at another angle. And let's hit the play button. You'll see exactly what's happening here. What we have is we have a Z offset and a little bit of an arc where we've duplicated and or made copies of the font and animated the parameter so that the Z offset goes from many copies to one copy. 
and the animated result is the Avid logo with multiple copies and finally residing as a single copy at the end of the animation. And when you break it down to its simplest form, all that's really happening is that the Avid logo, in fact, is just flying past the camera, as you can see over here. The final result of the renderer shows you the final portion of the animation. Now Fusion's acceleration is really dependent on the GPU. As many GPU cores as you have, Fusion will use them and take advantage of those. So the next step, how did we create these fabulous looking rays of light? This is created through Fusion's Volume Fog tool. The Volume Fog tool allows you to create real world volume fog. In this case, the volume is based on the occlusion of the Avid font. The beautiful spectrums of light are created through an animated color background feeding the volume fog tool. And the final result looks like this. Okay, let's take a look at some advanced tool sets that are included in Fusion. We have one single comp that can demonstrate all these technologies. This happens to be a shot from the Roland Emmerich film Anonymous, and the shot was completed by a visual effects company called Uncharted Territory. To begin with, it's important to understand this technology that is called the World Position Pass. I have a real simple demonstration that illustrates the use of the World Position Pass. Let's begin by opening up a comp. Now in this comp, besides a multicolored donut, this is a three-dimensional torus where we have the X, Y, and Z positions mapped to red, green, and blue channels. We have the X position mapped to the red channel, the Y position mapped to the green channel, and the Z position map to the blue channel. This is an important concept to understand because it is the basis of the world position pass. To continue what this means that based on this image Fusion knows where every pixel in X, Y, and Z space lives as it is mapped to the red, green, and blue channel of the world position pass. The world position pass can be generated from any 3D application and can actually be generated internally in Fusion as well. This is the view of the World Position Pass, and this is the RGBA Beauty Pass. If you seemingly rip this 2D image apart and divide it into a three-dimensional displacement, it looks kind of weird, but this is what it would look like. Luckily, for Fusion, we have the ability to replace it back onto a flat image plane. Imagine this. You saw earlier how I was creating masks in 2D and having to use a tracker to match move the motion of the mask to the actual image. Well, here's how it works in 3D. I can pick the mask position in 3D, including the ability to go behind objects. If I want to add a mask in the trees, behind these houses, it's a very simple procedure. And I can, of course, use all the masking functionality, the ability to expand sizing, and soft edge to the mask, just as simple as this. Now I have the ability to just show the mask only. There you see the mask occluded by the houses, and I could take the mask output, and let's say I'd like to put this into a color correction. I'll drag the color correction, up into the viewport and let's make, let's adjust the color of the tree. Maybe we want these trees to have like an autumn burnt red look and there's the result right over here. But the best part about it is I can start to play through the shot and the color correct sticks to the tree. No tracking required and as the shot moves ahead and if there is additional occlusion the mask obeys it. A very cool feature. So what else can you do with the world position pass? Well, let's talk about the particle system here. I'm just going to load up our particle system and there we have some chimney smoke that we've created. Now I'm simply going to pipe that into our merge, take a look at the merge. What happens if I want to position the emitter over a specific chimney? Well, let me do that. I'm going to pick, I could use my X, Y, and Z picker and apply the chimney smoke to that chimney. And again, as we start playing ahead through the shot, the chimney smoke sticks to the chimney 
because of the world position pass. And there's the result. It's no tracking required. The smoke just sticks to that chimney. A final use of the world position pass is in environmental effects such as volume fog. At this point we're just pre-caching some of the fog so this gives you a true volume fog and as well in the volume fog tool I have the ability to pick the fog position based on X, Y, and Z positions and of course it will obey all occlusions. The great thing about this volume fog besides the look, is that normally it's computationally very expensive. In traditional 3D systems, it could take up to 45 minutes to an hour per frame. In Fusion, we could render volume fog in about a frame every second, depending on your GPU cores. So not only do I have the ability to pick, but of course I have the ability to adjust the scale, and the offset, and the shape of the fog. I could also go into the Color tab, and increase the samples of the fog, which is very much like ray tracing samples. What we're really dealing with here is Z slices, slices in Z space. So if we take a look at our volume visualizer, there we go. In this case, you don't have to have a very big sample. I have just some fast noise tools that are 256 pixels in the X, 256 pixels in the Y, and of course, 256 pixels in the Z. Now the other great thing about the volume fog tool is the ability to take advantage of lighting. So in this scene I have a single light which is lighting the fog. I could adjust the samples, the density of how the fog effect is affected by the light, the scattering, transmission, reflection, and emission parameters as well as the coloring. And if I move up here and take a look at my point light, let's put it in the second viewport. There it is. If I make adjustments to the light, you'll notice on the left viewport, I have an interactive fog based on the light position. Just as simple as that. So I could just hear you saying, now, yeah, Jeff, that's great for CGI shots like the one that was created here. But what about a real-world shot? Well, let me show you an example of that as well. If we switch over to another comp, let's play this out. Here's a real shot that has some volume fog. And again, let's deconstruct how this was created. Let's go to the beginning. If we take a look at the first, the original shot, there's the original shot. Now, I had to do a couple things. I had to do some 3D tracking, which I am imported the data and there's a point cloud association and there's the associated camera from the 3D track. Now what I really needed to do was I also had to do a little bit of roto work which I used our polygon and our polyline tools and did a very very quick roto. The reason we did this is that this had to feed a displacement node. We had to create a 3D world because we are creating a 3D volume so that is what we've done. The next thing we'll do is apply the volume fog. Now the volume fog tool as I said it does take lights and of course if we switch to a two viewport and look at the final merge we do have a 3D light and you can see how the light is affected inside the fog you get the nice distortion. But how do we create the actual fog? Let me show you. The fog can be created with bitmap imagery. So in this case, we use a fast noise tool created in Fusion. We take multiple fast noise tools, and we can just adjust the seeth rate. So we're animating the fast noise tool. If you take a look at this in our 3D visualizer, you get a result that looks something like this. So there, is your 3D volume of fog created with bitmap imagery. So there you go, volume fog, a very powerful tool set for all environmental effects directly inside Fusion. All right, thank you very much, Jeff. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, I'm sure all of us uh, greatly appreciate it. Uh, before we go, I wanted to go over a few more things. Um, as we mentioned earlier, Keycode Media and Ion have put together some bundles uh, to get you started down the path of compositing with Fusion. 
uh, we have a couple different bundles. First is a starter kit, which is centered around an HP Z400 uh, that also comes with the Ion Fusion 6 software. Uh, as you can see, that comes out to a little over $5,000, and through key code financing, we can get that down to sub $200 a month. That's a savings of almost $600. Uh, we also have a performance kit pack if you're looking to really, really just start off really strong. And that's centered around an HP Z800. Uh, that comes out to a little over $8,000. Uh, and with financing, that comes out to about $250 a month. Uh, these systems, the Z400 and Z800, are completely qualified for AVID. They're the uh, strongest systems out there for AVID right now. Uh, and so if you were to put AVID Media Composer on here, it would perform flawlessly like a champ, as well as obviously use the Ion Software Fusion uh, software. A couple last minute things. Uh, what else can Keycode Media help you with uh, when you're moving on to Fusion? Well, first off, just because you have a computer and the uh, Ion Fusion software, a Media Composer, that doesn't quite make a complete editing system. So if you're looking to actually get cameras to acquire some of the footage, uh, maybe you need video monitors so you can view what your output is, or storage, portable or, or a shared storage, or even consoles for your gear. Anything that you can find in post that's going to help you with your project, that's something that Keycode Media uh, can obviously provide. And we can do that in a number of ways. Uh, we can either do that through consulting, uh, which is designing a customized workflow, uh, hardware and software for your particular project, or if you know what you want and you just want to buy it, we have a uh, uh, Keycode Media web store, which is uh, store.keycodemedia.com, and that will provide you with all the gear you could need on your own. Uh, lastly, this webinar will be posted on our YouTube page in the next week, and that's youtube.com slash keycodemedia. And if you want to get in contact with us, there's several ways to, either keycodemedia.com, you can check out Ion Software at ionline.com, uh, you can find Keycode Media on Twitter, you can also find me on Twitter to harass me, or you can also go to our Facebook page, and of course, you can always find us on the phone. So for all of us here at Keycode and all of us at Ion Software, thank you very much, and we will talk soon.